This is a mechanism of disease map for type 2 hypersensitivity, or the cytotoxic inflammatory reaction. I'll be talking about the etiology of type 2 hypersensitivity, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations. As in all of these flowcharts, each of these bubbles are color-coded according to this legend up here. Let's start briefly with the etiology in the very beginning. In type 2 hypersensitivity, you have IgM and or IgG antibodies that are erroneously binding to surface antigens in particular tissues of the body. Now this is important, it's particular tissues of the body that are affected. So in general, you'll see that for type 2 hypersensitivity, you have a more localized effect affecting one or two organ systems, as opposed to type 1 hypersensitivity or allergic reactions, where you might have a more systemic presentation, a more systemic anaphylaxis or swelling or redness or rash or hives. This will be more localized. This will affect one or two organ systems, and we'll see many examples when we get to manifestations. We know that IgG and IgM do many things in the inflammatory pathways and the inflammatory cascades, and um, this is some of the things that they do when they're activated. So you'll have antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity by the NK cells, that's natural killer cells. You'll have IgG binding to the FC receptor on neutrophils and macrophages. That causes cytolysis and phagocytosis, respectively. So the neutrophils cause cytolysis, the macrophages swallow up whatever the uh, target antigen is on, whatever the uh, FC receptor is on, and phagocytoses them. The target tissue is marked by opsonin, and this is a process called opsonization, and you'll have phagocytosis and complement activation that way as well. IgM, in particular, generates the membrane attack complex. This is another complement pathway that pokes holes in the cell membrane of the target, and that also causes cytolysis. IgG specifically triggers apoptosis, or programmed cell death, and IgM can bind to cellular receptors that inhibit the downstream signaling pathways for those receptors. So in general, these are all bad things. These are inflammatory things that either destroy or inhibit the normal functioning of the cell. So we can say that they all cause cellular dysfunction and or destruction. And again, I mentioned this typically affects a particular tissue of the body. So I'll give many examples of diseases that kind of undergo this type 2 hypersensitivity pathophysiology, and we'll talk about those manifestations in those specific diseases. So an acute hemolytic transfusion reaction, this typically occurs during blood transfusion, and you have destruction of the donor red blood cells by the recipient's antibodies. This recipient might have anti-A or anti-B antibodies, and those can destroy the, um, the, the those, those can become activated by the donor's red blood cells and cause this acute hemolytic transfusion reaction. It can present as fever, chills, nausea, hypotension, tachycardia, this kind of shock picture, dyspnea, and jaundice from the hemolytic anemia. You could release a bunch of bilirubin, and that can be a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction resulting in this transfusion reaction. The treatment for this, of course, would be to stop the transfusion and give medicines to kind of slow down that reaction as well. Next is autoimmune hemolytic anemia, and this can be of the cold agglutinin or warm agglutinin variety. In this disease, you have cold-sensitive antibodies, usually IgM, or heat-sensitive antibodies, usually polyclonal IgGs, and they bind directly to red blood cell antigens and they destroy red blood cells. The patient might present with pallor, fatigue, weakness, cyanosis, and in the cold agglutinin disease, it might follow cold exposure. So standard anemia symptoms, but um, in this case, it's not with a transfusion. It's just an autoimmune hemolytic anemia. The last anemia that we'll talk about is hemolytic disease of the fetus, sometimes also called hemolytic disease of the newborn. In this case, you have maternal antibodies, such as anti-A, anti-B, and anti-Rho, also called anti-D. These destroy the fetal red blood cells. Sometimes you have a uh, mixing of maternal and fetal blood that predisposes you to this hemolytic disease of the fetus. And the presentation can be the anemia signs in a newborn, and you might even have hydrops fatalis, which is a very unfortunate outcome. Good pasture syndrome is classically known as a type 2 hypersensitivity disease. Um, in this disease, it's sometimes triggered by a virus or a lymphoma in the body, but you have antibodies against collagen type 4. And this collagen type 4 is present in the kidney as well as in the lungs, specifically against the capillary basement membrane. So you have anti-basement um, membrane antibodies. 
and your symptoms will be related to the organ systems that, that are affected. So you'll have kidney problems and you'll have lung problems. You'll have a glomerulonephritis on your urinalysis. Patient might have oligouria or anuria, so very little urine or no urine at all. They might be coughing up blood, hemoptysis, and they might also have shortness of breath or dyspnea. Next is acute rheumatic fever. This is also a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. It's usually triggered by group A strep infection. That's, for instance, a sore throat, strep throat, that is not treated with antibiotics. When you have a group A strep infection, the body produces antibodies against the strep M protein. <clears throat> These antibodies specifically cross-react with nerve and myocardial cells in the patient's body. This is a process called molecular mimicry, where your body is making antibodies against a foreign invader, but those antibodies also happen to cross-react with some of the body's own cells. So this molecular mimicry causes a disease called acute rheumatic fever, where the patient has pancarditis, that's inflammation of all the layers of the heart muscle. Uh, of the heart muscle. Um, they can have valvular lesions, so they can present with a new heart murmur, or in really bad cases, heart failure. And some of the other symptoms include fever, malaise, fatigue, they can have polyarthritis, many joints are painful, syndenhem chorea, which is a weird jerky movement that people make. This is the nerve cross reactivity that we mentioned, Subcuta subcutaneous nodules, as well as erythema marginatum. That's all acute rheumatic fever. The next type two hypersensitivity disease is bullous pemphigoid, and this one will be differentiated from bullous, or so, sorry, from pemphigus vulgaris. So let's start with bullous pemphigoid real quick. In this disease, you have IgG antibodies against the hemidesmosomes. These are uh, proteins that kind of anchor the cell to the basement membrane below them. These are, um, and, and when you have these antibodies, the, you're, you're kind of going to break that anchor. So the cells will start to separate away from the basement membrane. The end result is that you'll have large, tense subepidermal blisters. And it's important to note that they're tense. These blisters typically don't break as much as in Pemphigus vulgaris. The patient will have very itchy skin, these blisters will be very itchy, and it typically does not involve the mouth, which is different from what we'll see in Pemphigus vulgaris. In Pemphigus vulgaris, the other skin-related type 2 hypersensitivity disorder, you'll have antibodies against desmoglein 3 and desmoglein 1 in the desmosome. The desmosome is cell-to-cell -cell junctions, so instead of the cell being attached to the basement membrane, the cell um, is also attached to other cells adjacent to it. And when those break, you'll have painful, flaccid blisters. These are intraepidermal blisters, and they tend to erode and crust. So try to differentiate the tense blisters that are very itchy but filled with fluid from painful, um, flaccid, broken blisters that are eroding and crusting. And this one also in involves the, the oral mucosa, um, typically involving the oral mucosa first, and then it kind of spreads into intertriginous areas. We're not exactly sure what causes this, but some triggers have been identified. Viral infections, some medicines do it, like ACE inhibitors, penicillin, and phenobarbital, and the diet can also predispose you to pemphigus vulgaris, can trigger um, episodes or flares. Onions, garlics, leeks, um, these types of foods um, have been associated with pemphigus vulgaris. The next type two hypersensitivity disease is myasthenius gravis. This is when you have antibodies against the postsynaptic acetylcholine receptor of the normal muscle cells. It's associated with a thymoma, so you might be able to see this on chest imaging. But the end result is that you'll have decreased density of these acetylcholine receptors, and it can even lead to muscle cell lysis. So um, it can be just kind of causing cell dysfunction, but it can also cause destruction of the muscle cells themselves. The result is you'll have weakness and fatigue of the skeletal muscles, and the characteristic clinical finding is that this weakness and fatigue worsens with use, so they'll kind of get worse throughout the day, you'll get more tired throughout the day, but they'll improve with rest as you let those acetylcholine receptors kind of regenerate, and the cell is able to kind of um, you know, make up for uh, the, the lost acetylcholine receptors. Some symptoms that are a little more specific than muscle weakness and fatigue include ptosis, diplopia, and dyspnea if the chest muscles are affected. Um, that's myasthenia gravis. Last one that I have listed here, Graves' disease, is another type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. In this case, you have IgGs against the TSH receptor, so it actually stimulates thyroid function and can cause thyroid growth as well. So the end result is you'll have hyperthyroidism and goiter. 
There are many symptoms of hyperthyroidism. You might already know them. They are listed here. They include heat intolerance, sweating, weight loss, warm, moist skin, diarrhea, increased appetite, this kind of hyperactive um, behavior, including restlessness, anxiety, insomnia. You can have tremors. You can also have tachycardia, palpitations, and a new onset arrhythmia. Some findings that are more specific to Graves' disease to differentiate it from other causes of hyperthyroidism include a diffuse goiter, ophthalmopathy, and pretibial myxedema. This is a swelling that you get, like over your shins, for instance, that's caused um, by, the, by, the, by the antibodies in Graves' disease. So these are just some examples. This list isn't exhaustive. There might be a few more that I haven't listed here of type 2 sensitivity uh, reactions. Um, but I guess the point is to, to notice that these are pretty localized. Some of them only affect the blood. Um, some of them only affect the heart muscle and the joints. Some affect the lungs and the kidneys. Pempagus vulgaris and bullus pempagoid only affect the skin. Myasthenia gravis affects the muscle cells. And Graves' disease affects a few organs, the eye, um, the soft tissue in your limbs, as well as your thyroid, of course. But they are generally less systemic than type 1 hypersensitivities. And this is kind of a flowchart of what's going on in type 2 hypersensitivity. I hope this was helpful, and thank you for listening.